Good evening, everyone. Uh, just waiting for everyone to fill their virtual seats and we'll get started here in a few moments. All right, it looks like we've got um, most of the people in the room now. So good evening, everyone. Uh, and welcome to the Southern Alberta Sport Fishing Regulation Changes webinar. We appreciate you spending the time with us this evening. My name is Alyssa Robb and I'll be your facilitator for the session. Before we begin, uh, I'd like to respectfully acknowledge that I'm speaking to you tonight from the traditional territory of Treaty 8. Tonight's webinar focuses on Southern Alberta and the traditional territories of Treaties 4, 6, 7, and 8. As we are coming together tonight online, um, from across the territories and homelands of many indig Indigenous peoples, I'd like to acknowledge all treaties in the province, as all of Alberta is treaty land, and the long history and deep connections that First Nations and Métis peoples have with this land. I honour this today in hopes of working together in a good way, and as an act of reconciliation and gratitude to those whose territory we reside on. There. So for tonight's agenda, uh, I'll complete our welcome in a moment by running through a few housekeeping items before we move into a presentation from senior fisheries biologists in the South region on Southern Alberta sport fishing regulation changes. At the end of the presentation, we'll move into the question and answer portion of the evening and we'll aim to adjourn the meeting at 8.30. So tonight we'll be using the question and answer tool on Zoom. On your screen, you should see the Q&A button shown. Depending on how you're joining in the call, this might be at the bottom or the top of your screen. It could be along the side on a tablet or an option within the Zoom app on your phone. In the Q&A tool, you can add questions about fisheries management in the South region that you'd like to see answered after the presentation is over. So as questions are added, you'll be able to view them and have the opportunity to upvote using that thumbs up like button associated with each question as shown on the screen here. If a question is something you'd like to see answered, give that button a click to help bring it to the top of our queue. As our time here is limited tonight, this will help us to ensure that we're answering your priority questions. Uh, while we appreciate all questions tonight, please understand we might not get through them, all of them in this session. At the end of the evening, I'll share alternate opportunities to find information and have your questions answered during the sport fishing regulations engagement as a whole. Oopsie, there we go. So we do have a few ground rules for our question and answer tool. First and foremost being to please keep it clean. I'm sure we won't have an issue here tonight, but we do, but do know that we'll be deleting any inappropriate content that does come up. Questions similar to those that have been answered will be dismissed, uh, and we'll be making an effort to group similar questions together. When you registered, you had the option to pre-submit a question. We'll be answering a few of those throughout the evening as well. So with that, let's see here, I'd like to introduce our presenter and panel for the evening. So Dr. Andreas Lewick will be our presenter tonight, and later on during the Q&A, we'll be joined by Jason Cooper, Kenton Newfeld, Dr. Stephen Spencer, Shane Petrie, uh, Stuart Nadeau and Jason LeFrancois. We also have a team of engagement and education specialists helping to ensure tonight runs smoothly. My cell phone facilitation and my colleagues Rob Harris, Jenna Curtis and Natalie S. Olson working away in the background. As such, you won't be seeing them on camera during our Q&A panel, but we thank them for su their support here tonight. So with that, yeah, I'd like to pass it off to Andreas so he can take, take us through tonight's presentation. All right. <clears throat> Uh, thanks, Alicia. My name is Andreas Luck. I'm the senior fisheries bio in the Crow's Nest Path, and welcome to this webinar tonight. Um, yeah, so I'm going to go through a couple of um, standard things about our fishes management system. I'm going to introduce you to what we do usually to get to the point where we are at today. Then we're going to talk a little bit about some notifications that we want to get you informed about uh, in terms of uh, what, what we're going to change um, in terms of regulations. Then we have some consultation items, so we would like to have your input. And after that, we're going to get into the commonly asked questions section, where we're going to talk about the questions that you have already submitted and will continue to submit during the session. So let's start with fisheries management. Um, our fisheries management system um, is uh, prioritized and, and laid out by the fisheries, wildlife, fisheries and Wildlife Policy Group and, and those, uh, that group sets the priorities within uh, fisheries for Alberta. In general, the first objective is um, the maintenance of um, biodiversity in the ecosystem. So we want to make sure that we have a healthy, self-sustaining fish population within the lakes and rivers that we actually enjoy. Once we're able to do that, um, any additional fish above that sustainable population level can be then allocated to anglers. 
And we have a little bit of a prioritization in that. So the first prioritization for that is um, to recognize the indigenous harvest and uh, the, the indigenous fishing needs. So that gets the first, um, the first uh, priority. After that, it's gonna be the um, recreation of fishermen that go and, and, and can enjoy the fisheries um, for themselves. And then we have the commercial use, which is nowadays mostly the guided fishery and um, fishing tournaments. The, the, the needs for Albertans and fish, uh, for fishing is diverse, so we're trying to recognize all needs um, within that um, system. How do we make our decisions? Uh, in order to allocate fish appropriately, we need to start with good information from monitoring fish populations. We need to understand how many fish are in water bodies, um, what species are there, what status are they in, so what size distribution do we have, are they healthy fish populations? In order to do that, we need to use standardized methods to ensure that the data is collected robust, repeatable, and follows current best practices from within the province and beyond, which means that we're trying to be on the top of um, our um, assessments in terms of what we do, uh, the methodologies that we use. We furthermore also utilize information that you, the general public, gives us by um, talking to you when we find you on the, when we meet you on the lake, um, or on the river, understanding what, what you like to fish for, how you like to fish, and what the experience was on the water body. Our fisheries management system is pretty much a, a cycle. And so we already started with the assessment. So after the assessment, we have the data, we're gonna assess, um, we, we're gonna come up with the status of that fishery. So using the gathered information from the field, we assess the water body for sustainability using what we call the Fish Sustainability Index, or FSI. You've probably came across this um, already when you look at our um, handouts that we have, or one pages for water bodies or the FIN reports. It's pretty much a report card. We summarize the assessment, uh, assessment results in those reports, such as the FIN reports or the water body report cards that you can uh, download right now for the water bodies to be consulted on, for example. These report cards discuss the information on the fish population in the water body, and the two graphs shown here on the slide are the most common representations of this data used. So on the left side, you see um, uh, the fin graph or the, um, or the fin illustration, uh, the, sorry, the FSI illustration, which is the fish population size and health, health that is shown in the left and, and increases in its sustainability and quality from the left for very few fish, an FSI of zero, functionally extirpated, which would be a not sustainable fishery, obviously, to the highest on the right, um, which would be an FSI of five that shows the lowest risk of the population and the best sustainable population that we can find on the landscape. On the right in the graph, you find um, the distribution and size of fish in the population, which is shown um, and compared to the representative means of population of the population structure of similar managed lakes in the province. So the black line is the um, the fish population that we assess or that we're currently concerned about, and the red line in that graph is um, a representative average of, of, of some lakes that are similarly managed to be able to compare those two population structures. So once we have that status assessed and we can provide the general public, you the stakeholders with this information, we're asking you what you think, because you have input into how we manage these fisheries. And for that today, we have two different types of, of regulations changes that we, that we will tell you about. So on the one side, we have the notifications. Notifications are items of proposed changes to sport fishing regulations that are recommended to address conservation concerns. Public surveys are not undertaken as there are a few management options available for that. And any questions you might have about those ones, you can directly um, direct towards regional biologists um, later on. On the other side, we have the consultation items we get to afterwards, which are items that we are seeking feedback from the general public for. Um, for each consultation item, you will see survey questions reflected in the survey that you can take part in online. So we're gonna start with the notification items. And as a little overview, we have pretty much two different regions for that at the moment. In, in the Southern region, we, we, we have uh, some notifications for the North Saskatchewan River and the Clearwater River, as well as for the 40 mile reservoir. I'm going to start with um, Clearwater and North Saskatchewan River, um, where we are, we are proposing to restrict the use of bait. 
AP, AP is proposing a bait ban for the Clearwater and Upper North Saskatchewan River to align this with the rest of the East Slope. Um, both of those rivers have bull trout populations present, and these are listed um, federal and provincially as threatened. Uh, the population in both of those rivers was assessed in 2017, and AEP found um, the FSI index to be at higher at high risk population at high risk of extirpation. Um, incidental illegal angling mortality is believed to be a major threat and to the population, and bait use increases catch and release mortality of angled bull trout. Um, we are proposing a full bait ban on, on the Clearwater River um, from the headwaters to the confluence with the North Saskatchewan River and for the North Saskatchewan River from Bighorn Dam to Highway 2239 in Drayton Valley to reduce this, this angling mortality. Currently maggots are allowed, um, but we would we will like to restrict that. The second, the second notification item, item is 40 mile Cooley Reservoir which we assessed um, for the pike population in, in the fall of 2021. During the index netting, we realized uh, we, uh, the data showed that we have a low abundance of pike in the reservoir. The northern pike limit currently is three pike uh, over 63 centimeters, um, but we need to reduce this down to a, a zero possession limit catch and release due to the conservation concern, which means that the management objective will come down to recovery. This lake needs some time to, to rebuild and allow pike numbers to increase to a more sustainable level. So those are the two um, notification items. Now we're getting to the um, items where we would like to see your input. And we're starting again, I'm slowly going from the north to the south in our region. We're starting with Brazil Canal, Crawling Valley, um, Reservoir, Pine Coulee, Clear Lake. And yep, so starting out with Brazil Canal, um, this will be an interesting one because um, we're proposing a new walleye angling opportunity in this lake. Last year's engagement showed us that there's a general desire to create more stocked walleye opportunities to expand put growth and take fishery. AEP has identified Brazil Canal as a potential location where walleye could be stocked to create put and grow take fishery. To maintain the population, the objective of put, grow and take fishery, we would stock walleye frequently. So not only a one-time event, but um, we will continue this to, to keep the population at a good level. Currently, Brazil Canal is primary a northern pike fishery with no walleye presence. The northern pike population was assessed at a, uh, and at high risk so low density in 2015, and the current regulation for pike is actually a possession a limit of three fish of any size. We know that uh, there is a base forage fish population in the lake, so it is actually a very good environment for oops, a very good environment for um, walleye to thrive. There might be some competition with um, with pike, um, but we we believe that this will be easy to do. Um, the introduction of walleye might impact. Oops, ah, sorry about that. <laughs> um, yeah, so the water regulations for Brazil Canal would remain unchanged until we are able to assess how the, the population of fish is doing, and that would happen the next plan, so it would be in 2024. For the next consultation um, lake or reservoir, we're looking at Crawling Valley. Crawling Valley, for this one, we are only asking for your input for um, the walleye fishery. The pike fishery will remain unchanged. I will not be talking about that right now. Um, Crawling Valley Reservoir is a well-known and popular fishery destination in the south. It's located less than uh, one and a half hours east of Calgary off of Highway 1. And it, it was stuck with walleye from 1990 to 1992 with a catch release regulation for the last three decades to allow walleye population to establish and naturally reproduce. As you can see in the graph, we actually have a very good population of walleye present and also a very, a very high distribution of large fish. This is very much to the credit of the anglers in the, uh, in the region because they have been very patient in the last three years, uh, 30 years, not three years, in the last 30 years, um, to have this as the only catch and release uh, fishery. The 2021 index survey that we did uh, last fall 
had the good news that walleye are actually doing well. We caught nearly 20 walleye per, lake, uh, per net in that lake. And it showed good natural recruitment uh, with a um, high number of different year classes and a very high abundance of walleye over 50 centimeters. So we're hoping that you will have um, some opinion on how we, would, how we should manage this. So we're offering two potential options. So on one side, we'd like for Angus to weigh in on, the provide, uh, on providing feedback. If you'd like to keep the spot fishing relations for walleye as it is, so keep it catch and release and maintain this trophy fishery where you can catch, where you have a high chance of catching memorable fish and high catch rate. Or if Angus would like to see some level of harvest by means of special harvest license, such as walleye tags, or perhaps the minimum size and daily bag limit for walleye where we're looking to maintain the water population as a suitable object, uh, sustainable objective. All of these um, options have some of their own trade-offs, especially on fish, fisheries with high angling effort, um, providing harvest, which will likely mean that the result will be a decline of fish numbers catchable in terms of size as well. So we, we're hoping that, that you will give us some feedback if you would like to see either of those options. Um, the next one is Sherburne, Re uh, Sherburne Reservoir. Um, again, we're only consulting on the walleye fishery. The pike fishery will remain unchanged. Sherburne Reservoir has been generally uh, has been general harvest regulations for walleye um, since 1990, 1996, with three walleye over 50 centimeter to be harvested. Population level uh, and level of use is relatively unknown, as access to to the reservoir is limited via the St. Mary's Irrigation District with a boat launch and a small day use area on the north side of the reservoir, but no further amenities such as campground close by. The last survey was completed in 2011 and walleye catches were relatively good at an overall catch rate of about 17 walleye per net. Um, the 2021 index netting survey showed um, similar catches for walleye being still at around 18 walleye per net um, with about 15, 14 walleye per net as adults, uh, which places this essentially at the highest moderate risk, potential recruitment concerns, but modest numbers of medium-sized walleye and high numbers of um, walleye over 50 centimeters, which is really good thing. In terms of engagement uh, and consultation for Sherwin Reservoir, we are asking for feedback on the overall management objective for walleye, either changing the overall management objective to achieve an old growth quality trophy fishery with a goal to maintain and improve your overall angling experience, catching walleye uh, with bigger sizes and increased chances of memorable fish. Or would you like to continue seeing some level of walleye harvest be made available with either continuing a, a minimum size and daily back limits for walleye or changing to a special harvest license such as walleye tax? Again, both of, those, both of those regulation options would support to maintain the walleye population as a sustainable objective. But each option also comes with its own trade-offs. So typically minimum size limits with high angling effort may over time truncate the water population where the number of larger size fish will decline. So far, this doesn't appear to be an issue at Sherman Reservoir, just given the number of fish presently over 50 centimeters. But with a higher amount of effort, this can still happen. The next lake we talk about is Clear Lake. And um, not to be confused with other clear lakes in the province, because there are apparently many. Um, this clear lake is located about 130 uh, kilometers southeast of Calgary, east of Staveley and Clare's home area. This is only a pike fishery. There's no other fishery in that lake. Um, even though this lake has been um, receiving a more stabilized water level since 2001, uh, a diversion canal was established. It is still considered a very shallow lake. In 2012, as a result of an Angler's request for Clear Lake to be managed, uh, request, Clear Lake was um, managed as an old growth trophy fishery to regulation. The regulation was changed to one pike larger than 100 centimeters. There is no previous survey data for Clear Lake either prior to 2012 or afterwards, only the newest survey done in 2021. The catch rate for mature pike was still. 11 fish per net, and this survey uh, and this survey this year did not capture any pike over one meter. 
but there are certainly many 60 to 80 uh, centimeter fish. So this is still a decent sized pike nonetheless. The data suggests that there might be sporadic recruitment given the lack of medium sized pike um, around the 45 to 55 centimeter range. Although the status is at a moderate risk, the old growth trophy quality objective is still not being achieved or reached. Hence, there's still the need to increase abundance to reach a low risk status of at least 15 adult pike per net or higher. We would like to have the input from the public for this consultation item. We're asking for feedback on the overall management objective to either continue with managing Clear Lake for the current old growth trophy quality objective by changing the regulation to catch and release to support continued increase of the pike population and size classes. This regulation will provide anglers increased opportunities to catch but not keep large memorable sized pike. Angling catch rate would continue to be good and should increase as the population continues to increase. Or would you like to see some harvest allowed, whereby changing to a management objective to a, of a sustainable fishery and change the regulation to one fish over 63 centimeters? So decreasing the current harvest size to a little bit smaller size. This change would allow harvest opportunity with the intent of maintaining the current fish numbers, but there will be less opportunity for catching memorable sized fish and overall catch rates might be reduced over time. For the last um, consultation item, we're talking about Pine Coulee Reservoir. Pine Coulee Reservoir is um, located west of Staveley between Calgary and Lethbridge. It used to be a walleye and pike fishery, which was changed by public um, consultation to a put and take fishery for rainbow trout in 2017. Since then, it has been stocked every two years with triploids, there are rainbow trout. And um, currently, this is, this is how it's managed. AP has received several requests to change the fishery management objective from a put and take trout fishery to a quality stock trout fishery. Pine Coulee Reservoir is capable of supporting its unique fishery fishing experience, which will produce trophy sized fish with the possibility of some harvest. However, this management would uh, this management change would result in the f in in, in um, some regulations to the fishing, um, uh, yeah, some changes to the regulations. Sorry, um, which would mean it would be a limited um, open season from April first to October thirty first. Uh, there would be no bait allowed anymore, bait or bait fish allowed anymore. Walleye and pike harvest would still be open, but trout would only be allowed to harvest one fish over fifty centimeters. This is in alignment with other um, fisheries that are managed as a um, quality stock fishery in the province, such as Police Lake. For this consultation item, we are asking for feedback on if you'd like to keep the sport fishing regulation as is, which would mean five trout open all year, bait and bait fish allowed to continue management of pine coolie as a put and take trout fishery. The opportunity in that would be that more fish would be able to be harvested and it would remain a year long, uh, a year round fishing opportunity. However, the trade-off is that the fish um, that you will be able to catch will remain smaller. And it's actually a fairly common fishery because we have a lot of lakes that are stocked with straight up rainbow trout for put and take fishery. Or would you like to see us um, develop a quality stock fishery in Pine Coulee, meaning that the season will be reduced to April 1st, October 31st. Um, we would allow the harvest of one rainbow trout only that would be larger than 50 centimeters and we would prohibit the use of bait and bait fish and adjust the current rainbow trout stocking program to support a quality stock fishery management objective. The opportunity for that would be that you would have the chance to catch bigger trophy sized memorable fish more frequently and you would it, it would be more a boutique and a more um, unique fishery um, as a destination to fish it. The trade-off would be that there would be less number of fish to be harvested, the season would be shorter, and it would be limited mostly to the open water season, and there would be no bait allowed. So we're very interested in hearing what you have, um, what you would choose for that, and looking forward to um, seeing those results. Um, those would be all the consultation and um, notification items we have for you today. Um, and as you can see, they're, they're spread out across the whole southern region. And with that, I think we're good to get over to the questions. I'm going to hand it over to Alicia again. Excellent. Thank you very much, Andreas. So that wraps up our presentation. Thank you for all the information you presented tonight. Uh, so I'll now take us into the question and answer portion of the evening. You can stop sharing your screen there, Andreas, and I invite our panelists to turn their cameras back on as we prepare to answer your questions tonight. 
So as a reminder, we'll be using Zoom's Q&A tool. You should be able to see the Q&A button on your screen and use that function to send us your questions. If you haven't already, as I see we've got a couple in, in the Q&A tool there. When you see a question that you'd like answered, please take the opportunity to use that thumbs up, upvote button to help bring it back to the top of the queue. So while you're busy asking and upvoting, uh, I'd like to start us off with a few pre-submitted questions this evening. So the first is a package of two on the topic of gear, fishing gear. So the first comes from Brody, who asks, can you ban treble hooks on trout streams? And the second is from Nani, who asks, what actions are underway to have the federal fisheries regulation updated to allow Alberta to implement barbless and other gear changes? Thank you for, for, for uh, there's quite a few questions in the piece submitted uh, regarding gear restrictions, including barbless hooks and, and uh, treble hooks. It's something that we've heard, uh, especially from our um, uh, East Slopes anglers um, and a real desire to see, especially barbless hooks regulations. Um, just a bit of history, in 2017, we reached out to Albertans in a similar format, asking them uh, what their, um, opinions were on uh, for supporting barbless hooks regulations in Alberta. And across Alberta, that, that percentage came back at, at just over 30%. Um, however, we didn't just stop there. We, 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 I don't know, we're, we still hear it annually as part of our consultation. So we're, uh, as part of our Bow River Cumulative Effects Modeling Study, which uh, many of you, there was a, the, the session is on, uh, available online um, uh, through My Wild Alberta, uh, uh, our, our, our Facebook page, as it, we looked at the, uh, the science team modeled the impacts of barbless hooks and the effects on the recycling rates of, of uh, on, on trout. Um, so there's, a, and it, it, overall it's, it's generally not that, um, uh, it's, it's not showing a, a tremendous uh, impact on the recycle rates of fish. However, there is a desire to, to continue to, to uh, less hand, less, lessen the handling of, of fish. So what we hear you, there's some complexities involved with some of the regulation changes. It is in, in woven into some of our federal regulations. And we, we currently are uh, working with federal government to uh, en enable the regulations to allow for us to make some gear restrictions. Uh, or uh, And uh, it wasn't ready for this consultation, but we hope to have, have them available uh, for future sessions. So. That's a, the latest update um, on that. Yeah, I can I can kind of add to that a little bit. Uh, Thank you, Shane. I mean, I, I see I see Nani's asking kind of clearly somebody that heard me answer this question previously, um, and they're looking for an update. So so what Stuart was referring to is Alberta angling in Alberta and angling regulations in Alberta are managed through a set of regulations under the Federal Fisheries Act and. Alberta has the ability to make changes on many uh, in, in many schedules of that act and uh, on using just annual variation orders, which is just something that a decision we would make on an annual basis and the regulation is changed for the next uh, angling season. There are some, however, though, that we don't have the ability to make those uh, changes for uh, on an annual basis and it, we have to work with our federal colleagues to uh, make those changes. Uh, and it takes quite a while to do that because they have their own legislation and regulation folks to, to that work with us on it. So um, I know I've in the past mentioned, you know, the 18 to 24 month period, but, but essentially um, we have taken an approach where we're, we've approached the federal government and said, we want to make changes in all of the schedules uh, and uh, put the tools in our toolbox so that whenever things like gear changes, and there are other examples as well come up in, in terms of changing zones and different types of things, um, we're able to do that in a very efficient and effective way. And uh, that process is currently undergoing. DFO has signaled to us that they can make some regulation changes to allow us to do this, but for other aspects of it, um, it, it, it'll be more complicated. So uh, I don't have a definitive answer in terms of a timeline. Stuart's indicated we wouldn't get it for this uh, regulatory cycle, which is correct, but we'll be targeting to have those approvals in place so that we can make changes uh, for the next regulatory uh, regulation cycle, which would be the, the next uh, angling guidebook in, in uh, 2023. Awesome, thank you, Stuart and Shane. 
Uh, so the next pre-submitted questions that we have are, have a bit of a, um, an enforcement theme to them. So the first comes from Curtis. Uh, why can we not hire more fish and wildlife officers to control the amount of fish taken from our waters exceeding legal, legal limits? The second is from James. Uh, can you share poaching statistics for the Southern region? Hi, I'll take that question. Um, actually, currently we are recruiting for new fish and wildlife officers. We had a conversation with them yesterday. You're just cutting out a bit there, Jason. Oh, um, we actually have a competition that opened yesterday. Uh, Just cutting out a bit more there, Jason. Yeah. Sorry about that. That works there. Yep. There you go. Uh, we currently uh, just recruited 10 new officers last year. Um, so they hit the field this past fall. So they are uh, stationed in Maryland, Alberta. And I believe the second one was poaching statistics. Uh, I don't have any uh, actual statistics to share today. Um, that being said, with the increase in license sales, we have seen an increase in recreational users. Um, with that, we have seen an increase in poaching activities, especially I can speak for myself. In my area that I cover, we have noticed an increase. But we would encourage the public to report any uh, fishery or buy a uh, fishery or hunting violations to the report of culture hotline or online. Uh, there is an online report of culture webpage now. So. Awesome. Thanks, Jason. I think we're just having a, just a little bit of trouble with your mic, but we did hear a bit of what yeah. you said there. So thank, thank you for that. Thank you. So, so the next pre submitted question comes from Ken. Uh, who asks, does the public have a direct role in the wording of fisheries management objectives and who approves their wording? I'll take that. Um, so I, um, I'm, just to back out uh, a bit, a lot of what we're doing tonight is um, getting feedback from, from you on um, these various uh, fisheries to get our uh, fisheries management objectives. And so it's very important that we do hear from you and, and that we communicate uh, what, what options we have and what opportunities we have. So uh, fisheries management objectives are, are mentioned in uh, more detail in our uh, fish conservation and management strategy, which is online. Uh, you can find it uh, on our site. And then there's also uh, more information on My Wild Alberta. But uh, well, when we have fish to allocate, what we're looking for from you is what do you want? And the, the default for the province is uh, sustainable fisheries. And uh, um, where we have uh, options, uh, we, we, um, we put those out and uh, the majority wins when we, we get feedback. So that's, that's uh, basically how uh, fisheries management objectives work. As far as the wording, I, I, I think that uh, the question speaking to maybe what regulations do we decide for fisheries management objectives? And so that can be, that's something that we, we need to um, look at the, the, the science and the data behind uh, each of these fisheries. So uh, um, can we support a uh, quality harvest at fisheries X? So we need to look at, well, how, how many fish are in the lake? Um, what are the growth rates? Uh, how many people do we expect to come fishing? It's a supply and demand kind of uh, analysis. And from there, we, we can come up for our, with options. So uh, say a small lake close to a big city, we have much less options than we do in larger lakes, especially those that have less fishing in them. We, we can uh, certainly have more options at that point. So uh, I'm hoping that got to that uh, question. Thanks, Stephen. Just just a little bit to add add to that question is is we're also faced with the desire for less comp complex regulations. So keeping standardized regulations on water bodies so that uh, which helps over, overall imp imp improve compliance and overall sustainability of the fisheries. So that it, it does it, 
we're always uh, we, we, we're constantly in a balancing act trying to find that the, the uh, uh what the, trying to find the same the, the consistent approaches to to uh, making decisions on the sustainability of our of our of our fisheries so hopefully that's hopefully that just uh, just a bit of an ad thanks thank you sir and stephen for that answer uh, so our next question uh, is from the q a now it comes from ken uh, references made to high illegal fishing. Where can one see the details and basis for making the claim? Uh, I can answer that. Uh, thanks for the question, Ken. Um, I, th I think you made it in reference to the, the changes on the Clearwater in North Saskatchewan uh, and the proposed implementation of a bait ban. So that's, that's kind of how I'm going to approach it uh, for answering. Um, for those changes, the bait ban is actually uh, so the bait ban was um, is being proposed to address kind of all angling mortality. So there's there's the legal angling mortality, which is definitely a part of it, but also the incidental catch and release mortality. Um, so we know that when uh, anglers are using bait, uh, fish tend to have higher mortality when they're caught with bait versus without bait. So the the bait ban is really meant to address both the legal and incidental catch and release mortality. And, and we've made the determination that that is a major threat for those populations using our cumulative effects models, or you'll hear referred to as Joe models often, um, based on what we know about angler use in, on those streams, the proximity to, to major centers, and, and what we're hearing from, from anglers out on the landscape and our enforcement staff. We're, we're making an estimate that about, there's about 6% um, mortality on those populations due to angling. And when we put that into our uh, cumulative effects models, that comes out as one of the higher threats for those populations. Um, so, th so that's why we're proposing this bait ban as a measure to uh, protect those the bull trout populations there. Um, if your question, if I'm, I'm completely off base and your question was more broadly, um, we, we use a lot of ways to kind of collect information about uh, illegal fishing and infractions. Um, you know, we have a close relationship with our officers and, and hear about enforcement actions, uh, report of poacher calls, um, talking to anglers themselves on the landscapes and hearing from them are all ways that we get an idea of how much illegal angling activity there is at a water body. And that varies quite a bit uh, from water body to water body. Um, and I don't know, Jason, if, if you want, you can jump into, uh, but uh, yeah, I think generally that's how we kind of get an idea of, of what's out there for illegal angling activity. Excellent. Thank you, Kenton, for your answer. Um, so our next question then uh, comes from Kyle. So why are the options down south for walleye always three over 50 centimeters or zero limit? We should be seeing a limit of one fish per person as a nice in-between option. Yeah, I can take that question. Uh, yeah, great question, Kyle. Um, yeah, certainly if one were to flip open uh, the regulation books, uh, you know, let's say two, you know, two years or, or older uh, type of thing, uh, certainly you would have seen that. But uh, yeah, the last couple of years, certainly that's changed. Uh, we do have a number of different opportunities for, for walleye now with uh, looking at uh, evaluating a, a harvest slot. Uh, so a number of those, those reservoirs changed within the last two years in 2020. Um, such reservoirs like Chin, Stafford, 40 Mile, uh, Milk River Ridge now all have a uh, a slot size uh, harvest limit uh, for walleye and in some cases even for, for pike as well. Um, if you're referring to maybe a, a limit of one fish, maybe no size, more of a kind of a liberal opportunity, um, that is a little bit more higher risk. Um, certainly, you know, depending on the reservoir, there might be an option for that. Uh, we do have an example of that uh, Park Lake, I believe is, is one such uh, reservoir uh, where there's, you know, maybe some other environmental conditions that may limit uh, the ability for that reservoir to produce a more sustainable or more robust walleye population or uh, type of thing. So yeah, you know, stay tuned. Uh, I, I believe as you know, we go out and assess more of those reservoirs, get a better understanding of water management and how that plays a role. Um, there may be some additional opportunities as, as we go forward uh, down in the south. So thanks for the question. Awesome, thank you, Jason. Our next question comes from Martin. Uh, I support the bait ban notification we heard tonight. 
Are there any rivers in ES1 or ES2 where bait is still allowed? When will, they, when will AEP look at eliminating bait entirely in these waters? Uh, I can take that one again. Uh, thanks, Martin. Um, this is going to be a, a short answer. Uh, the, the only two water or only two streams in ES1 or ES2 that allow bait currently are the Clearwater and that section of the North Saskatchewan River, the ones that we're proposing to move to a bait ban. So if those proposals go through for 2022-23, the upcoming year, uh, there will no longer be any streams that allow bait. Uh, and that's uh, mainly to, you know, to protect our, our species at risk that live in these streams and uh, and protect these fish populations to make them more sustainable. So thanks for the question. Thank you, Kenton. Our next question comes from Kyle. Pine coulee has been completely ruined. You guys are feeding the current walleye and pike with trout. Let's see some test netting info supporting that the trout aren't all getting eaten before any decision about a trophy trout fishery takes place. Hi, um, yeah, I'm taking that question. Thanks, Kyle, for the question. So Pine Coulee used to be a walleye fishery and a pike fishery um, after the, um, the reservoir was filled. Uh, we hoped that walleye fishery, the walleye fishery would take off and they would find a place to spawn, but it didn't happen. The walleye were not uh, reproducing. So with that, we asked the public in, I believe, 2017 that we would um, change this to a trout fishery because the walleye would not remain um, in the reservoir as a self-sustaining population. So the current regulation for walleye and pike in that reservoir is basically a depletion fishery, allowing you to keep any size of um, walleye and pike that you catch up to the limit that is specified. So with that, we're believing that there's no net test netting needed to actually have a trout fishery in that lake because the trout that are currently getting caught are on very good sizes that we have on fairly good authority from some anglers out there that there are actually fish that are not getting caught the first year growing up to pretty good sizes. So um, while it is a calculated risk at the moment, we are, we are of the opinion that it is a possibility to have it as a, a quality stock fishery management as well. Um, and we're not going to change the regulations for walleye or pike in that lake. So the depletion on those two species will continue. Uh, uh, furthermore, once we see how the uh, trout population will develop, we're very likely going to have a test netting um, of that reservoir in the coming years to see how the fishery is doing at that point. Great. Thank you, Andreas. Oh, yeah. Thank you, Andreas. Uh, so our next question comes from Douglas. Uh, getting a hard copy of fishing regulations is getting more difficult every year. The maps we can download from Realm are not of an adequate quality to enable easily or easy viewing on a portable device like a phone. As you zoom in, the quality gets so bad you can hardly read the printing. How can regulations be expected to, to be followed and enforced with poor information on the regulations? Thanks, uh, Douglas, for that, that, that question. And, and we're pleased this year that we have, we've, we've heard that feedback previously. Uh, moving from the uh, hard copy, uh, there's, there still is a significant amount of uh, hard copy avail of, of the regulations available. But this year, uh, earlier this summer, the uh, fisheries regulation app was, was developed. And I'm hoping that, sorry, I can't see it, but I'm hoping that we're, we can share that link out with, uh, uh, with participants. Um, and we're, we're, again, it's been out for quite uh, several months now. Um, and so that uh, it, it, we appreciate any feedback that you can get. It's, it's pretty easy to use. It's on a, pl uh, it's, uh, a platform that's been long used by our uh, River Basins um, application. So, and it allows you to click and get the, the regulations on a water body or basin. Uh, basis. So something that's a, that's a new development, we're, we're, uh, I, I've, I've used it personally it, and, and it, it works quite well. So I, I'd appreciate feedback that uh, you can give on it. Thank you. Thank you for that, Stuart. So our next question comes from Gabriel. Many anglers on social media and through other means of communication have suggested that current laws to punish poachers need to be updated and suggested that prison is a must for repeated offenders. Are there any plans to update those laws? Part of this. So currently when uh, fish and wildlife officers are dealing with violations, they have two methods that they can, or two routes that they can go. They can go specify penalty route, which is a specified 
specified fine amount determined, predetermined, or we have the option of sending individuals to court. Uh, once the matter gets to court, uh, it becomes the court's decision on what the fines and penalties will be. Uh, it's generally based on the case law, um, but ultimately the courts do have the final say. I, I can add a little bit here too. Um, and just that's exactly right. It's ultimately up to the court when somebody goes there to determine what the penalty is. Um, and we, you know, annually go through exercises where we look at offenses and we make suggestions on uh, specified penalties, so fines, or whether they should be. Uh, w whether they should be handled that way or should be a court appearance and things like that. But we don't really have influence over uh, uh, the final penalty of sending somebody to jail. We should add that um, Alberta does have a history of those uh, real uh, offenders. Uh, there's some uh, substantial uh, fines, fines. Yeah. Ha have, been, have been provided by our court system and, and, and I, I, that's, a, that's something that we hear from other jurisdictions is they're actually envious of uh, some of the fines that are the, uh, and deterrents that are handed out in, in Alberta. So, uh, so thanks for the question and suggestion. Perfect, thank you all for the answer. Our next question comes from Brody. Uh, are trout streams going to single hook only? Thanks for the question, uh, Brody. In, in short, uh, for, for this regulation cycle, uh, that isn't on the table. We, we do have a number of, especially ES1 fisheries, uh, where we do have high, and we especially saw it during COVID, high use, and we're starting to see some uh, negative impact on some of our fisheries populations. However, so, so it's one option that needs to be on the table, or uh, gear restrictions need to be an option on the table to, to perhaps uh, to, to ensure sustainability of our uh, fisheries. We'll be reaching out, um, that's a commitment. Once we have the regulatory um, capacity to, to actually uh, do, uh, implement gear restrictions before before it happens. We'll be reaching out on a, on a format very similar to this, just making uh, making sure that it's supported by Albertans. Thank you. All right, thank you, Stuart. Our next question comes from comes from Warren. Why are irrigation lakes subject to limits as they can be drained at any time? Yeah, that's a that's a good question. I can take that one, uh, Warren. Um, yeah, like I mentioned uh, previously, uh, yeah, there's certainly some reservoirs that may be exercised uh, a little bit more in, in terms of how the water is managed. And and certainly on, on dry years, we do see that uh, water level fluctuation because again, we need to be mindful that the, the irrigation reservoirs, you know, their primary purpose is for agricultural use. Um, certainly fisheries do benefit from that. And, and certainly there is some tremendous fishery um, in the south and, and opportunities. Um, a lot of these fisheries have provided recreational opportunities for, for many years, many decades. Um, you know, case in point, uh, look at uh, Crawling Valley tonight where we now have an opportunity to provide some options there. Uh, Lake Newell is another classic example of where, you know, it's a quality fishery for, for walleye. Chances of catching large walleye there is quite good with the, the special harvest license, even 40 mile as well. So, um, but yeah, in cases where there is uh, reservoirs where they are drawn down and it does uh, limit or, or restrict uh, fish uh, populations, certainly there is some opportunity there uh, to provide more liberal uh, limits and as we go again and, and evaluate those, um, we will identify those and, and make those changes. And you know, one such case we do have is, is Park Lake there. So feel free to jump in, Shane, if you've got anything more to add on that one. But uh, yeah, I think that uh, kind of covers the, uh, yeah, yeah. the question. There, yeah, so. no, th thanks, Jason. That's exactly right. And many of the reservoirs uh, sustain walleye populations, sustain pike populations, whitefish populations. Um, even when they're drawn down. When we look at reservoirs that are drawn down and you see on, if you, if you look at the water management websites online, it looks a little bit, it, it is dramatic, don't get me wrong, but it looks even more dramatic when it says it's drawn down by 80 or 90%. But it's, that is the, that, that only contains the water level in which they are able to draw water down from. It doesn't include 90% of the entire reservoir. 
Um, and in addition, irrigation districts, in fact, all 13 irrigation districts acknowledge that reservoirs are multi-use and they are and, and the managers in those in those irrigation districts desire and, and support fisheries management uh, in, in them as well. So, so it wouldn't we wouldn't want to completely allow the depletion of species in reservoirs that could could sustain these fish for people to use over time. Well, certainly, yeah. There's you know quite a bit of infrastructure. You know, even if we look at Crawling Valley with what the EID yeah. has developed there in terms of fish access sites, uh, the campground, the marina. Yeah. Um, yeah. So certainly they are aware of that and, and do take that uh, in, into mind when when they're managing water um, again. So. Excellent. Thank you, Shane and Jason. Our next question comes from Kyle. Uh, what is being done about non-resident guiding taking place in Southern Alberta? I'm talking mostly about BC guides bringing clients into Alberta to fish so they don't have to pay their classified water fees in BC or use up their guide days. So I didn't take that uh, one, Alyssa. Um, thanks for the question. This, this has been a question I've heard more than on more than one occasion. Uh, as everyone is probably aware, we're going to have an angling guide license in Alberta implemented uh, available on, uh, for April 1st. It'll follow the same kind of period as an angling license, which will be April 1 to March 31 of the following year. Um, our initial approach to the guide license is to really make an, an accessible, relatively affordable license and, and to kind of allow us to get a sense and characterize the guiding industry in Alberta. Um, Right now, there there are no plans. In fact, we have interprovincial agreements that that you know uh, we have to consider when we're if we were to exclude guides from uh, other provinces from guiding in Alberta. Um, so so it's that's not uh, part of what we're doing in in, uh, in terms of the process and how we're setting up the guiding license. Uh, so nobody will be excluded from uh, British Columbia or anywhere else. That, that's uh, that's not the approach we're taking. Perfect, thank you, Shane. So our next question comes from Rob. Uh, a quality lake at Pine Coulee is highly desired. Are there any plans, or are there plans for any additional quality stocked trout fisheries? <laughs> um, as far as I know, thanks, Kai, for the, uh, th thanks, Rob, for the question. Um, currently, Pine Coulee will be the newest addition to the quality stocked fishery in Southern Alberta. And as far as I'm aware, and I'm looking at all the other senior bios around the table here right now. I don't think we have anything else planned in the hopper right now for next season. Yeah, sorry, I can <laughs> jump in. Um, I, I, uh, I agree, Andres. I don't have anything planned in the Rocky area at the moment either. But, uh, you know, we're always open to hearing uh, what folks are interested in. Um, you know, we're trying always trying to get the right balance between different types of fisheries that we offer, uh, whether it's quality stock or put and take. Um, so, if, if you have a desire for more quality stock fisheries in specific areas or sp at specific water bodies, uh, definitely reach out and let us know. And, and you know, we always try and uh, try and meet anglers' desires in terms of our stock fisheries. And I would also add that there are other fisheries. I know that Reeser Lake is a, is, is a, is a quality fishery for tiger trout. Um, uh, you know, their police, of course, is, is down in the south, and and uh, even even Michelle Reservoir has a has a bit of a higher uh, uh, harvest limit for for brown trout. So there are other other places where you can catch quality trout. Excellent, thank you for the group answer there, fellas. Next question comes from Bruno. Uh, how is the sustainability of the walleye population at McGregor Lake uh, brackets reservoir? Are we getting closer to setting a harvest limit similar to Gull Lake in the near future? Yeah, I can take that one. Um, yeah, I just pulled up uh, the McGregor 2020 um, in index netting uh, report here. And yeah, fortunately it's still in that FSI2 category, still high risk uh, in terms of the, the walleye population status. Uh, in McGregor. However, we did stock it uh, with walleye just this past summer, and it, it is part of the, the new walleye stocking program. Um, we plan to, to con continue to stock it uh, with walleye for the next uh, foreseeable future in order to, to help that population and, and meet that sustainable um, uh, goal of, of getting it to an, an FSI 3 or that uh, uh, 
um, more sustainable level where we can actually look at options to provide uh, harvest opportunities. And, and you mentioned seems similar to Gall Lake, that certainly could be a possibility uh, with uh, a harvest slot limit there. So, so unfortunately, it's just not quite there yet. Um, we hope when we go back to assess it within uh, maybe the next two or three or, or five years, uh, probably three to five, um, that we will see the, the benefits of, of that catch and release regulation and also the stocking uh, to provide uh, some angling opportunities there for, for anglers. So thanks for the question, Bruno. Perfect, thank you, Jason. Next question comes from Elliot. Uh, do the requested changes to the Alberta Fisheries Act regulations from DFO include giving the province the ability to set and enforce regulations and limits for the non-game fish species? Uh, yeah, that, that, that is, uh... That's a great question. Uh, I like it. I'll take that one, uh, Alyssa. Thanks. Um, yes, that, that's part of the package. Identifying fish that uh, uh, that we could in um, that we have in Alberta or could stock in Alberta that would allow us the immediate ability to regulate those species um, is is part of the, the 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 talks that we're having with them right now. So uh, so it's a it's a short answer. Um, uh, it's a great question, but yes. Thank you, Shane. Next question comes from Brody. Uh, are you going to be stocking grayling in the south? Well, I gotta answer that one. Um, hi, Brody. Um, yeah, so we, uh, as you probably know, remember, a, we had four lakes in the south that we used to have um, grayling populations, Iron uh, uh, Bear Pond, Quarry Lake, and Wet Pond. Um, we currently do not have grading in the hatchery and that's a lengthy process to get them back which will take about um, 10 years. Um, so last year we engaged on that specific question and actually asked Albertans if um, Albertans would like to see a, a, a grading a fishery back in the south which means you would have to start the lengthy process of getting those fish reared in the hatchery system again and before we actually can stock them out that'll take a while. So we asked what we should do in the interim and we actually have now um, interim in quotation mark species that we have stocked in those lakes and managed those lakes um, for catch and keep and, and, and specific fisheries like tiger trout and cutthroat trout um, to be fished in there. But in the long run, Albertans have been very vocal about having um, grading back in, in some lakes and we're working on getting this achieved in the next eight to 10 years. Thank you, Andreas. Next question comes from Ken. Uh, who sets the measurement value for each level of FSI? Are the public involved in setting the measurement value? You can take that one. Uh, thanks for the question, Ken. It's a great, a great one. Um, this is something that we we spend a lot of time a time on when we're developing the fish sustainability index for each species. So, in a nutshell, uh, we use what we can find for. Uh, reference populations to set the baselines for our FSI. So we, we look for healthy, um, high density, relatively unexploited populations. Um, what we think is, is as representative as we can find of, of you know, an unexploited, unimpacted population. And we find as many of those as we can. Um, and we look at them all and, and we find kind of an average uh, density or, or catch rate. Um, often, you know, depending on, on the species, so for walleye and pike, we use index netting. For bull trout and whitefish and so forth, we use electrofishing. We need, we need that same type of data from these reference populations to build those, those FSI categories to really do these assessments well. So we also need that data from those populations. And once we find some suitable populations to set that, the reference for the FSI, you know, we set that, that upper, the upper baseline, the upper most sustainable level, so the FSI-5. And then from there, we work down using uh, um, standard breaks. So FSI-4 is 70% and then 50% decline and 20% decline until you get down to FSI-0. And those are based on uh, the IUCN uh, conservation categories. So um, it's, a, it's a very standardized process and, and we look for those reference populations to kind of set the initial FSI-5 and then work from there. Um, is the public involved in setting those measurement values? I would say often not 
directly other than you know whether when they're involved in helping us collect the data or identify those populations that we can use for reference um, that's often where uh, where the public can contribute to this process by um, you know directing us to those those populations that are really good that can set that FSI 5 baseline um, but typically we use the you know standardized fish sampling data um, for those populations to to structure the FSI on. So hopefully that answers your question. Perfect, thank you, Kenton. Next question comes from Douglas. Uh, is there any hope of getting rainbows back into Crawling Valley? Hi, Douglas. Uh, yeah, I can take that question. Um, yeah, I know when Crawling Valley was, was first created there, um, it was stocked with rainbows and it actually did produce a, a quite a, a quality, you know, trophy, rainbow trout fishery those those rainbows grew rather rapidly um, again that's kind of as a result of you know a newly created reservoir there's kind of that founder effect where there's abundant uh, food and, and fish can certainly take a, advantage of that uh, however you know as time has gone on we we now have you know a rather uh, high higher density walleye population within Crawling Valley. Uh, there's Northern Pike, and then we also have Lake Whitefish, Cisco, uh, Yellow Perch, uh, Burbot, and, and uh, a few sucker species as well. So yeah, stocking rainbows at this time certainly uh, would go against uh, our stocking policy uh, in terms of some of the guidelines of, you know, not to stock uh, trout into water bodies that contain, you know, some of these top predators like walleye and pike. And, and essentially maybe just like the, the Pine Lake example would be um, where it was suggested before that, uh, I think it was one of the questions where, you know, we'd simply just be, you know, essentially feeding the, the pike and the walleye that are there given how healthy uh, the walleye population is and, and that recovering uh, Northern Pike fisheries. So unfortunately, no, there's, uh, not any considerations or, or options right now for considering rainbows being stocked back into Crowing Valley. Thank you for that answer, Jason. Next question comes from Jim. Would it be possible to publish the previous year's poaching statistics or at least a distribution of fishing violation statistics in the following year's Alberta Fishing Regulation Guide? My apologies, just trying to find my mute button. Uh, thank you. We, we, we had that in the pre-submitted questions. I, I know we've uh, put the those statistics in, in the hunting regulations. We got into that practice. Uh, it's a really good suggestion and one that I will take uh, forward to our enforcement our, our management team to uh, look, at, look at options for providing that information. Thank you for that suggestion. Awesome. Thank you, Stuart. Uh, next question comes from Peter. What is being done to address the growing concern of invasive species such as Prussian carp that are making their way through Alberta's waters? Yeah, that's a great question, Peter. Um, yeah, obviously, you know, Alberta is certainly uh, challenged uh, by Prussian carp, you know, also, you know, included with that is goldfish, even some koi. And, and, and the multitude of other um, aquatic invasive species like the Chinese mystery snails in Lake McGregor, the flowering rush uh, that we continue to see uh, and impacting some of our, our native fish habitat. And, and obviously, um, you know, the continued threat of, of mussels entering Alberta's uh, waterways as well. So um, yeah, our aquatic invasive species specialist, you know, I got to give a shout out to, to Nicole Kimmel. Um, this is a, a huge file that uh, she's responsible for. Um, and yeah, we work uh, collaboratively with her in, in, in trying to, to address these uh, when they do come up. So certainly Prussian carp, um, you know, have established, you know, throughout the Red Deer River watershed, um, essentially from Dixon Dam downstream to the Alberta Saskatchewan border, and, and many of those tributaries that flow in into that reach of, of river as well. Certainly within the Bow River, uh, Calgary and downstream and continuing to portions into many of the southern uh, irrigation reservoirs like uh, Newell uh, through that uh, EID system and, and in other uh, portions of the irrigation systems too. So uh, the goldfish and the koi, you know, Sometimes they get mixed up with, you know, Prussian carp, but are, are mostly found in, you know, kind of those urban stormwater management ponds. 
Um, in such cases that we have been successful in, in trying to control those and eradicate those using uh, what's called uh, rotenone, which is a, a fish uh, poison essentially, which um, we can go in and, and, and eradicate those. But uh, once they get into a, like a flowing system like the Red Deer River, um, options become rather limited. So, you know, obviously any invasive species, you know, including non-native trout uh, pose a serious threat to Alberta's fish and, and, and wildlife resources. You know, uh, our public education and awareness is, is essentially our best tool in, in prevention when it comes to aquatic invasive species. You know, Alberta has a, a number of resources online um, that you can look at. Um, we've got the report uh, invasive species hotline as well. I believe it's one eight five five three three six boat. I believe um, that you can also call in and, and um, actively report invasive species as well. So, um, also you know we certainly encourage. Uh, I encourage anglers to yeah, if they do catch a, a carp, um, you know if they can properly identify it, confirm it. Um, if it's in waters that uh, it hasn't been reported in, please let us know. Um, but yeah, don't throw it back. Um, retain it. Um, you can decide to eat it or just simply dispose of it in a proper way as well. So yeah, hopefully that answered your, your question. Thanks, Peter. Hey, Jason. Uh, next question comes from Steve. Uh, he asks, I would like to know if there's a chance that competitive fishing events such as catch photo release tournaments that have provided many great angling opportunities in other provinces will be considered differently than they have in the past. I like the catch and release trophy opportunities the fishery provides. Competitive angling provides other types of opportunities and local economic boosts. Uh, I'll take this one. Uh, thanks for the question, Steve. Um, catch photo, photo release is kind of a, a, a bit of a new approach for, for much of the competitive fishing. I don't know how much of it is actually going on in, in other provinces. Um, I know in some of the conversations we've had uh, with Saskatchewan that they don't see a, see a lot of it, but um, I know we, you know, particularly in Alberta, we're seeing quite a bit of it at, uh, at, on the Southern uh, Walleye Trail and things like that. We, all of their tournaments are now catch photograph release. And, and, and I think it, it, it's certainly, you know, it, it's really hats off to, to them for, for moving to, uh, you know, techniques and practices and doing a lot of things. I think that, uh, are, are helping them and, and, and helping our fisheries, uh, or helping uh, our ability to manage fisheries. We, we currently don't have any plans to allow uh, competitive fishing though on, on uh, water bodies that do not currently allow harvest. Uh, um, so we wouldn't allow them on a, a open harvest that is. So, so we don't currently have intention to allow them on a special harvest license lakes or on catch and release water bodies. Um, Similarly, we won't allow them to target species at risk or things like that. Um, we're making some changes to the uh, regulations this year, uh, to the definition of competitive fishing. Uh, and and uh, we're also kind of uh, looking at how the regulatory process uh, for competitive fishing will we'll have a lot more online uh, opportunities for people. It should be a little easier to fill out forms, report and pay. Uh, you won't have, you hopefully won't be dealing with paper checks so much anymore, but um, uh, yeah, so hopefully, hopefully that answers. It's not, at this time, we're not, we're not currently looking at uh, allowing uh, those on uh, catch and release water bodies. Thank you, Shane. Uh, next question comes from Lynn. I'd like to see no motorized boats on the bow downstream of Calgary to Carsland. Is there any consideration for motor ban by AEP? I can take this one. Uh, thanks for the question, Lynn. Um, yeah, this is a, an issue that's come up a lot over the years, and we, we hear a lot from anglers on this one. Um, so right now, you know, we're working on assessing the threats to to the fisheries and the impacts on the fisheries in the Bow River through a cumulative effects process. And we're going to be objectively looking at whether the you know, motorized boat use is, is having impact on those fisheries or not, um, and whether the, some action needs to be taken there. Ultimately, um, restrictions of this type, so restricting motorized boat use on this section river would fall under Transport Canada's jurisdiction. So they'd be the ones who, who'd have to uh, implement that that restriction and getting that in place is, is a bit of a, a bit of a long process in the past we've had uh, you know it's been a it's been a difficult process getting that done so um, not a definitive answer for you um, but it's something you know we're 
we're looking at through our cumulative effects process. And, and if it did have to go ahead, uh, it'd have to go through Transport Canada. So hopefully that answers your question. Thanks. Thank you, Kenton. Uh, next question is from Daryl. Can you show the distribution and number of quality walleye fisheries currently in the South region? How many walleye fisheries in the South have harvest opportunities? How many are managed with catch and release only, but for recovery objectives? Hi, Daryl. Thanks for that uh, question. So uh, the, the, the quick answer is no, I can't show you that right, right off the cuff here, but um, very interesting question. So, um, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, some of the uh, fisheries that we do have in the south are um, fishing remarkably well. And in fact, in 30 years of working with fish, I've seen some of the largest walleye of my career this, this summer in some of the uh, fisheries in the south. And and once again, all our assessments we put uh, online and you, you can check out the uh, the distribution of fish. So uh, arguably, um, uh, you know, uh, several of our fisheries are meeting um, what we've defined as a quality or trophy walleye fishery. And uh, I don't have that uh, off the cuff to, to show you, but um, uh, they, they are doing well. And, and if, if we are getting interest on that, that's something that we should uh, discuss further and allow people to um, wade in on that fisheries management objective to see if they want it. But uh, it, um, our regulations in some lakes are producing some very nice, uh, very nice fish. And um, uh, if we do um, um, change the fisheries management objective to, to make sure that that's um, more long lived, because as you know, things can come up and go down and um, um, to be able to react to that to address it either through uh, allocation of tags or perhaps adjusting the regulations to ensure we, we can maintain those those really uh, really nice fish, larger fish, uh, higher catch rates that we see at those quality and uh, trophy fisheries. Uh, that's something that we should have further discussion on. So I, uh, I thank you for your question and uh, look forward to further discussion on it. Thank you, Stephen. Uh, next question comes from Steve. How about implementing rod fees for out of province anglers on high pressured waters like the Old Man and Bow River watersheds, similar to what BC has in place? Hi, I'll take a, I can take a uh, stab at that question. Um, the, uh, I know in, two, two, in 2017, we did look at uh, higher fees for non-resident anglers. Um, it, it was done more of a, it was to bring uh, sport fishing license fees for non-resident anglers in line with neighboring jurisdictions. So that, 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 that's the, and we've been watching that. COVID's kind of thrown a wrench in, in uh, 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 of non, non-residents and non, uh, non-Canadians uh, visiting Alberta waters. Um, however, um, it, at the present time, it's, it's, it's something that it, it remains a tool as we assess threats on our, on, on our fisheries that, um, it's it's one option that we can take to lower the number of uh, that lower the angling pressure and impacts on, on the fishery it remains just one tool and again before we'd make any uh, uh of, the, of those sorts of of changes we would we would test back uh with with the angling community as as to their thoughts thank you okay thank you Stuart. Uh, we have a submission here from Brody. Put all lakes one under, not over. Leave the breeding fish in the lake. Thanks, Brody. Um, so uh, what you des described is called a maximum size limit. So um, everything under underneath the uh, regulation is um, harvestable and everything over is protected. And, and, and the regulation itself is it, it works, but it, it works in certain circumstances. And it's kind of a risky regulation because as you can imagine, if everything below is vulnerable um, and um, there's enough uh, mortality or you have several years of um, mother nature not uh, um, allowing for good spawning conditions, then what can happen is the, um, the older fish get old and die and not enough babies come up to re reproduce them and we collapse the population. And so um, if you look at the, uh, the numbers, it's one of the more risky regulations and it will work in 
you know, um, low use areas or very productive populations, but uh, we've stayed away from it to, because uh, um, our, our information tells us that it, it won't work in, in almost all uh, situations in Alberta. But, uh, yeah. Interesting question, thank you. Thank you, Stephen. Next question comes from James. What is happening with the perch population? Number and sizes seem low in most lakes. I yeah so I could speak to that if uh, if Stuart uh, isn't um, the uh, uh, yeah so we 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 did hear this from uh, from uh, anglers last uh, year in our sessions and uh, we are working on this in the background um, it will take uh, um, it, it's going to take some time to bring forward a management plan and uh, from there we'll want uh, feedback from Alberta anglers on it but uh, right now we tend to have pretty liberal harvests on perch and uh, it's kind of like money in the bank when there's very little money it doesn't uh, take much spending to uh, keep your uh, your dollars down so uh, we're, we're looking at, um, at at the information at this point and uh, um, a management plan will need to come together and go out for consultation to Alberta anglers for uh, options to um, you know, identify areas where we want to bring perch back and uh, have uh, better perch fishing. I, I can, yeah, this, uh, that's exactly right, Stephen. I'll, I'll just add to that a little bit in that we currently are looking at perch and developing options to, to maybe come out uh, to, to stakeholders with uh, uh, in in the, in the not too distant future, so uh, so that's that's absolutely right. We just are looking at the types of things that we can you know establish with perch fisheries, and uh, and then we'll we'll once we sort some things out, we we definitely will be coming out to talk to stakeholders about it. Great, thank you for those answers. Next question comes from Joseph. Will Eagle Lake uh, near Strathmore remain catch and release for the foreseeable future? Yeah, I can take that one. Um, yeah, I believe uh, Eagle Lake was last sampled in 2015. So yeah, it certainly do. Um, it uh, was high risk for for both pike and and the walleye in, in terms of that status assessment uh, that was conducted at that time. But uh, looking at the the size distribution of, of the walleye there, um, you know, within that uh, index netting uh, report that's available to, to to everybody to view as well online. Um, you know, it's quite evident that there was some strong year classes that were coming up in that uh, 20 to the 30 centimeter range. So now, now those walleye should be um, into that uh, larger size category. Hopefully that, you know, uh, conditions have allowed for, you know, annual recruitment to, to occur uh, continuing through that time. So potentially this uh, could be an option for, for some future opportunities. So um, good that you brought it up and, and we'll certainly consider that uh, and look um, in, in implementing that into our work plan for hopefully the, the, the coming year or, or next year um, in order to assess that one and get an updated status and then get out to, to, to anglers to, uh, with engaging on that one if there's some opportunities there. So appreciate the, the question. Awesome, thank you for that, Jason. Next question is from Brent. Uh, I understand that there is logging done close to Racehorse and Daisy Creeks. Will this impact the fishability in the area? Hey, I'm gonna take this. Thanks, Brent, for the question and for your concern about this. So in general, we know that um, logging around watersheds can um, introduce some sediment, um, higher flashability of water input into the system and some nutrients into the, into the, into the um, stream. Um, so we don't actually, I cannot specifically answer what you would expect um, change in race of the Daisy Creek would be like, um, but our cumulative effects models for species at risk, especially for rest of cuts for trout, incorporate this in our assessment of um, the risk to the population. And I cannot give you a certain answer right now of how much that would actually be incorporated into this. However, there are also regulations, federal and provincial in place that, that regulate uh, the buffer zones along streams that have to be incorporated and, and held up so that um, the, the stream is protected and still has a buffer around the edge of the river. Thank you. 
Thank you, Andreas. Next question is from Nani. Uh, how will the funds from guide licensing be used? Uh, I can take a take a crack at that. I don't think I um, have a great answer because I don't think we've really determined uh, the allocation of the licensing funds. Um, it's going to go through the realm system, so it won't. Um, uh, we it won't be an expensive license. We're probably you know uh, within the up to a hundred dollar range. So and there aren't uh, we don't know how many guides there are, but uh, I think that's yet to be determined. I guess. Uh, it's, uh, we can certainly uh, follow up later on that. I'll look into it, and for when I do the uh, guide update, uh, guide angling guide license update in the provincial uh, uh, webinar on the nineteenth, I'll I'll make sure that I can I can address that. Perfect. Thank you, Shane. Uh, next question from Plix: uh, Any plans on stocking Traverse Re Reservoir for a put and take fishery? Yeah, I can take that one. Uh, yeah, great question, uh, Kix. Uh, yes, I can confirm that, uh, yes, Traverse Reservoir was stocked uh, with walleye this, this past season. Uh, in terms of plans to, to make it a, a put and take fishery, uh, certainly, you know, that potentially could be an option uh, in the future. However, yeah, just like we've done and presented tonight, um, you know, we would uh, look at the, the management uh, objectives there for, for walleye, list out the, the opportunities and yeah, get feedback from, from anglers as to what they would like to, to see with uh, an objective for, for walleye on Traverse Reservoir, but also, you know, considering McGregor and, and Little Bow, given the, the close proximity and that those reservoirs are, you know, hydrologically connected, um, making a kind of a you know, considerations have to be, you know, made for, for that as well in terms of, you know, the water management uh, side of things as well and for, for enforcement uh, considerations as well, because, uh, you know, maybe uh, Jason can attest and there is, you know, we certainly have had a number of uh, uh, angling concerns there with, with poaching as well um, with Traverse and McGregor, where we've have you know special regulations in place, there's so without that has to be con considered as well. So you know, great question. Um, likely when we go back to, to assess it here in the next couple of years to assess you know the, the success of the walleye stocking, uh, we'll have options uh, to present uh, just like we are tonight uh, uh, for you in a couple of years time. So great question. Just to add to that, just um, uh, I encourage uh, participants to tune in next Wednesday night to the provincial. Uh, webinar on and which uh, an update on the provincial stocking program, which will be uh, uh, presented to, uh, and uh, it's it's some exciting news there. Yeah, yeah, that's certainly um, that's a good good plug for next week there, uh, Stuart. Uh, yeah, you know, I've just been responding, but uh, certainly if, if folks are interested in in the walleye stocking program as to which reservoirs were stocked, um, some of those have been mentioned tonight, but yeah, more details will be provided uh, in next week's uh, webinar. So yeah, thanks, Stuart. Thank you for those answers. So we have a set of questions here um, with, uh, along kind of a similar vein. So the first is from Kenneth. How about a course for first time fisher people similar to the hunter training course, which is compulsory for first time hunters? And the second from Remington, is there any talks of trying to implement a master angler program in Alberta? I can take a crack at these ones. Um, yeah, those are those are great, uh, great suggestions. So. Um, I mean, the, there have been courses and, and materials that have been developed over the years for for uh, fishers uh, similar to the hunter training course. I remember taking taking a course in outdoor ed in high school. I was along those veins, and I found it super uh, super helpful and interesting. Um, right now, they're not compulsory for for getting a license, um, but that's something you know that that's always something we could consider if if enough people support that. So if if folks are, are really feel that that's something that we need, um, you know, reach out to us and let us know. I think you know, increasing education awareness is always important, and and we do have a number of ways that we try and you know get messages out there and educate anglers in the public, whether it's through social media or or engagement sessions like this, or just you know talking to folks out on the land. So we are trying to get those messages out in other ways, um, but you know, a, a course is is always. Um, an option. Um, so we don't have plans for it right now. Uh, similar to the to the master angler program, we, we don't 
not that I'm aware of, have any plans to implement something like that in Alberta at the moment. Um, but maybe in the future, you know, it's something that if, if enough folks uh, are asking for it, it, it could be something that we implement and, and could be valuable for, for anglers. So Just, uh, not a definitive answer, but yeah, sorry, jump in, Stuart. Yeah, not a problem. Uh, thank you, Kenton. Uh, one of the things that uh, the Alberta Hunter Education Instructors Association has available on their website is a online um, a fish education uh, course. I know during uh, COVID, they've uh, when people were home last uh, over the last season, uh, they they did have it available free of charge. Um, I encourage folks to have a have a look. It's again the intent. Uh, we're working with the HIA folks, uh, folks over at HIA who has developed the online uh, hunting education uh, and instruction material. Uh, it was it was a there was a really good fit to partner up uh, for fishing education. So it's it's something that is available. It's not mandatory or not part of the regulatory. It's just a resource that's available, um, an additional resource uh, available to Albertans. So just like to uh, put a plug in for that. Perfect. Thank you. And just looking at the time, this is going to be our last question of the evening. Uh, and then I'll follow up with a little bit more information and close us out. So the question is from Aaron. What is the science behind a low catch bracket for walleye uh, versus a high catch for large walleye? Wouldn't catching less juvenile fish be more sustainable than catching more mature fish? Oh, thanks Aaron for that uh, question. So um, yeah, uh, it's all about how much fishing and harvest is going on in your water body. So um, just a little aside, I, I was looking at um, some old harvest reports that uh, federal fisheries did back in the 1890s from Alberta. And sure, in that time they're using nets, but um, they were already seeing, you know, at Pigeon Lake, we're seeing the fish get smaller, we're gonna have to use less nets. And so it's, um, it's, it's, it's all about how much fishing and, and how much harvest, as I said. So, um, uh, it depends on the situation, um, like slots, maximum, minimum size regulations will work in, in various circumstances. You, you tend to see a lot of minimum size regulations here in Alberta because um, it allows the fish two or three years of spawning before they're vulnerable to harvest. So that, that keeps the population engine going. There's enough females to produce eggs and males to fertilize them to keep the, the population going before they become vulnerable to fishing. So um, the, the three over 50 versus the one 45 to 50, um, you'd have to look at the scenario and, and we are testing slots uh, that right now in Alberta, and as you probably know, we've got it on a few lakes and we're monitoring, uh, monitoring that carefully to see how, how the regulation does perform. But, uh, um, typically a minimum size regulation, even if it's uh, one or three fish, typically people don't get all three of their 50, uh, fish over 50. And so that's, that's kind of a, uh, um, a red herring to kind of make a fish joke. A lot of people will get one, very few will get two and very, very few will get three over 50. So it sounds like a lot of fish, but uh, when, when we do our krill surveys, um, we tend not to see everyone getting three over 50. So it does sound like a lot more fish, but typically isn't. The 45 to 50, um, it, if there's enough fishing, enough harvest, we may not see enough fish to get through that slot to, uh, to produce the eggs that we need to keep the population going. So that's, that's, that's the trade-off. So uh, minimum size regulation, um, it protects three years of spawning, whereas the 45 to 50, if there's too much fishing and harvest, we might not see enough survival. So that's, that's, that's the basic difference between the two. Depends on the situation. And uh, um, yeah, but interesting question, especially for a fish nerd like me. Excellent, thank you, Stephen. So that brings us to the end of our quest question and answer session. Uh, thank you to all panelists for your contributions this evening. Before I close the session tonight, I have a few items to share with you. So I'm just gonna share my screen here quickly. There we go. So the first, as you know, our sport fishing regulation engagement is currently open. Uh, please go have a look at our engagement page on alberta.ca where you can find a survey. Uh, we're looking for your feedback on our consultation items through, through that survey by January 7th at noon. On that engagement webpage, you'll also be able to find our ask the expert tool. 
If there were questions we didn't get to tonight or that arise for you following the session, please pop on over to the Ask the Expert where we'll be happy to respond to submissions received there. There's also a series of fact sheets on the webpage that will give you more information about every water body being discussed in this year's engagement. Uh, if you like the session tonight and feel up to joining us for a few more, please come on, come on back to learn more about sport fishing regulation changes in the North region tomorrow night and prov provincial fisheries and updates on the evening of Wednesday, January 19th, as the fellows mentioned earlier. Um, and My Wild Alberta is our source of information on all things fishing. You can follow, follow My Wild Alberta on Facebook or find more information on the website or, of course, on alberta.ca. Family Fishing Weekend is coming up on February 19th, or February 19th to 21st. Uh, it's a chance for those without a sport fishing license to try their hand at some ice fishing. Uh, so it's a good event to be aware of. And finally, when you exit Zoom tonight, you'll be offered the opportunity to answer a few questions regarding this session. Please do take the time to fill that out if you can. Uh, your feedback helps us to continually improve and ensure that we're meeting your needs. So it's greatly appreciated. And finally, uh, on behalf of our presenter panel and behind the scenes team, thank you for taking the time out of your busy week to spend with us. Have a lovely evening. And we